By following Agatha Christie's own footsteps across England, it's possible to discover the places which shaped the extraordinary worlds of her fiction. Towards the end of her teens, England was moving out of the Edwardian age and starting to become the modern nation we know today. As Torquay, the town of her childhood, lost its 19th century glamour, Agatha's attention moved towards the social life held in the great homes of the surrounding countryside. She would go to weekend parties, Goodwood for the racing, fancy dress balls, that kind of thing. She was the kind of girl who would get invited to things. In 1912, the then Agatha Miller attended a dance at Ugbrook House, an 18th century stately home in Devon that would be the setting of a life-changing encounter. The house is now run by Alexander Clifford. His ancestors, Lord Lewis and Lady Mabel Clifford, organized weekend long parties for local girls to meet potential husbands. This is the visitor's book. And if you see here, we have A. Christie in October 1912. This was the signature of Archie Christie, a young pilot attending a dance at Ugbrook House where he would soon catch the eye of the 21-year-old Agatha. Well, this is the dining room. It wasn't always that way. It was one of the great entertaining rooms of the house and the one that we believe Agatha and Archie met. This event was pretty much like speed dating. In 1912, you didn't have a phone to swipe left or swipe right. You had a list of names of who to dance with. And when Archie was with Agatha, he took the list of names from her and said, no, 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 don't want to dance with him, very boring, not with him, not with him. And I think Agatha liked that style. And she was absolutely swept away. Archie and Agatha were married on Christmas Eve, 1914. But World War I split them apart. Two days after the wedding, Archie left for France where he served as a pilot in the Royal Flying Corps, while she remained in Devon and worked as a nurse and pharmacist. Staying at home as the war progressed, Agatha saw the population of Torquay change, and with it came fresh inspiration. As the Germans moved towards Belgium, Belgian refugees began to come to the south coast of England, and the locals were very welcoming. Expelled from their homeland by the German army, 250,000 Belgians flooded into Britain from 1914. It was the largest influx of refugees in British history. They clearly had a strong impact on her because when she was thinking about who her first detective could be, she knew it had to be a strong, interesting figure. She was thinking about things like a schoolboy or a scientist, uh, but in the end decided that one of these Belgian refugees might have an interesting story to tell. In 1920, Agatha published her debut novel, The Mysterious Affair at Styles. The lead character was the now iconic Belgian detective, Hercule Poirot. I imagine the Belgians coming for refuge weren't wearing beautiful spats and silver-topped canes and twiddly moustaches. Poirot is an outsider looking in and therefore can perceive things that the insiders, the English who are busy murdering each other in country houses, don't perceive about themselves. More than 60 years after the first Poirot book was published, a new generation was introduced to the character through a hugely successful TV adaptation. It is satisfying, is it not, Chief Inspector? In a case, when at last one knows everything. I thought you knew everything anyway, Poirot. Poirot is seen by some as a bit of a figure of fun. He's not necessarily taken that seriously. And this, of course, is, is the great dynamic that we as a reader can enjoy, because we know that these people have underestimated Hercule Poirot. By the mid-twenties, Agatha and Archie were tiring of London. With the birth of daughter Rosalind just after World War I, they were now a family in need of more space. They moved to Sunningdale, a commuter town in Berkshire. This is the house that Agatha and Archie moved into in early 1926. 
quantities of bathrooms, as she said, a basin in every room, all the modern amenities. Their life seemed set fair, really, in every external way, but things were not great under the surface. The town had two extensive golf courses, and Archie, who had fallen in love with the game, indulged his hobby in every spare moment. Archie absolutely adored playing golf. Agatha wasn't so keen on that kind of life. I mean, she calls herself a golf widow. As she grew apart from Archie, Agatha became unhappy at Sunningdale. But despite this, her time there was incredibly productive, professionally and commercially. With new financial independence, she bought herself a car, a Morris Cowley. The car undoubtedly symbolised freedom. It meant that she could live the life that she wanted to live. She wasn't somebody who was ever going to be happy just staying in one location. The freedom symbolised by the car only exacerbated Agatha's sense of being trapped in Sunningdale. On the morning of Saturday, December the 4th, 1926, Agatha Christie's Morris Cowley car was found abandoned near the beauty spot of Newlands Corner in Surrey, 30 miles from her home. Agatha was soon declared missing and the press descended on the Surrey Hills. Simon Calder's grandfather, Richie Calder, was one of the first journalists to report on the story. It was like the opening page of an Agatha Christie story. We have something headed foul play theory and the possibility that either Mrs Christie had taken her life or met with foul play. As the story unfolded, reporters turned their attention towards the movements of Agatha's husband, Archie, on the night of her disappearance. Colonel Christie spent the weekend with friends about six miles from the spot where his wife's car was found. Reporters soon discovered that Archie had been having an affair with a younger woman called Nancy Neal. Agatha was a very interesting, complicated woman. And maybe Nancy wasn't. And maybe that's what Archie wanted. The police learned that Nancy was amongst the friends Archie was visiting that weekend. This was a psychodrama that was unfolding. You had Agatha Christie driving 15 or 20 miles south from her home to this remote beauty spot because it was actually very close to Godalming where she knew her husband was spending the weekend with his mistress. Agatha had made a career from stories more gripping and puzzling than anything in the crime pages of the tabloids. But now she had the nation transfixed with the unfolding drama of her own life. 11 days after she disappeared, Agatha was found. She had been spotted at a spa hotel in Harrogate by another guest. For nearly two weeks, neither the police nor the press had thought to look for her in Yorkshire. The fact is, they should have known where she was because she had written a letter to her brother-in-law. She said, I'm going to a spa town up north. That letter should have been taken much more seriously. They were pretty high on the idea that she was dead. One can be so much the prisoner of a hypothesis that one actually disregards plain evidence which is put in front of one's nose. In the immediate aftermath, Archie and the other family members told the press that Agatha had lost her memory and had no explanation as to why she had gone to Harrogate. Speculation has raged ever since over Agatha's true motives. Agatha divorced from Archie soon after the disappearance. Reeling from the trauma of this episode, she retreated from public life. It really did divide into her life. But her life after 1926 was a different thing. She had to remake it. With Archie no longer in her life, Agatha was emboldened by a newfound freedom. She travelled far away from Sunningdale and her old life to the deserts of Iraq. It was here, as she indulged a lifelong passion for archaeology, that Agatha finally buried the past. <laughs> 